and it's about a person meeting Henry James, and I was going to write a play on this same subject, but I turned it into a poem. And Henry James was born 100 years ago this year. Dialogue with Henry. You would appear to me if I sat in Washington Square Park and patiently waited in the background the purrs of stroller wheels, arguing checker players, rumbling skateboarders, park regulars beating bongo drums. In the foreground, you, more real than phantasm, dressed in a starch white shirt, cufflinks. You would remark that I've lived for years near where you were born, grew up, a three minute stroll to the site. I've inhabited the area your fictional Catherine Slover called home, a six minute ramble to the setting. I would mention my uncle's name is James. My father's best friend was called Henry. Oh, the parallels between our lives. As we sit on a hardwood bench and deal with leaves and jumping squirrels, you analyze my character by way of my lamentable taste in clothing, and then you'd read through and frown at my writing. Most of all, you'd advise me to keep at it. I know you'd urge me not to give up, not to ever contemplate suicide, no matter the toil, the struggle. Despite the world's distractions, its bongo noise, its innumerable demands and irks of living, you'd poke me and whisper with a hiss of impatience, tend the flame. I read this somewhere else and also messed it up. <laughs> and it happened, this really happened to someone who lives in this, who used to work in this area. He was shoved in a train station. Um, but the poem is not really about him, it's about the person doing the violence. Afterwards, your insanity flaps about you like a too large dress. The hem bellows around your thinness. An impossible amount of extra cloth sags at your shoulders, flops about your wrists. A victim of your own aimlessness, you roam down and up and down the platform of an elevated train station while salivating, patholegged you, crazy with boredom, bored by your own craziness. When you spot the man you want, nothing in you protests. Don't push him forward. Don't feed him to the oncoming train. You smirk at his too large raincoat. You peer through his innocence as through a stage scrim. The scenes all make believe to you, only as real as a fairy tale. After you shove the man and run, leaving him to the train's excruciating wheels, leaving his raincoat soaked in its splatter of flesh, you can't feel the ground, the air, the world. Your feet motor upon no pavement. All sounds blend to one sound and then to a thick swoosh filling your ears with no sound. Eventually, crouching into yourself, you await the sirens, the handcuffs, the bars, the huge airs of the judge and jury. You are both deranged enough and sane enough to expect strained forgiveness for your massacre of one, your high octane flight of lunacy. That assumption, that anticipation is the worst violence of all. Wow. <laughs> My mother died at the end of November, right before Thanksgiving, and I've written about 30 poems about her sickness and her, her death. Um, I think I'll just read two or three of them. Talking. 
During your final seven months, our conversations became fragmented, lost their flaws 12 or 13 seconds after starting. In our information age, a lack of information, a black hole of incoherence, scribbled audio. I felt your chilly absence as we spoke. Even more than I mourned your actual death, I grieve for the loss of your personality while you were still alive. You who've been gone from life for five weeks, oh, are missing from a sculpture, panel whose wall relief has vanished, hole in an igloo's wall, where a robber stole a block of ice or somebody has allowed it to melt away. Empty space hangs in the air. A gash in fabric I would patch with warm wool. Fill up with cluttered, cozy pouches. With folksy, aboriginal trinkets. If only those things would do. Death trance. My daughter talks to me, but I just stare at something powerful beyond her right shoulder. It hypnotizes me. It's more entrancing than an owl's prolonged hooting, more compelling than a demagogue's portrait or the faces of my own children. In its sacred separateness, it exists as a definite place or maybe an ethereal dimension. Its visuals sing and the sound enchants me more than any lavish landscape or earthly chant or tantalizing aroma. Leave me, daughter. I want an excellence unheard of in hospital rooms, wards, or cheery rehabilitation centers. I'm ready for the realm with blazing trumpets, leveled mountains, exalted valleys, untouched meadows. I'm eager to travel to the world you can't perceive, even if you were to peer over your right shoulder. And I usually write my poems in the first draft in one sitting, but this one I wrote over several days. And on the final day, um, a card arrived, a sympathy card arrived in the, in the mail from Linda Lerner. And that sympathy card gave me the ending to the poem. <laughs> After a woman's death, one, your kitchen without you, a skeleton without flesh. Two, the cause of spasms, grief, the effect of grief, spasms. Then more heaves of anguish like scattered autumn leaves blown by wind and settling eventually in neat piles. Sadness evolved into solemnity. Three, a discovery, making the sign of the cross, the movement of the arm, up, down, side to side, is a gesture that gives comfort, a sort of self-hug. <laughs> Four, what's that? That shimmering is you, hovering at your own funeral, not in the casket, but in him tinged air as the sun's gold notes blaze through stained glass. Five, past trailer parks where people thrive with life, through rows of stately spruce trees, among somber pine cones, the casket winds from church to cemetery. At rest at last, the earth-colored casket, which is really rainbow-colored. Six, past quaint gazebos in, counterpart, in counterpoint with stallings, with flocks of gray beige sparrows, with leaves moving in contrary motion to the heavy hired limousines, the funeral procession returns to where it came from as you retrace your steps back to the sea of creation. 
7. The day after your burial is December 1st, a new month, a coincidence <coughs> worth noting. The sky blows owl eye blue. A sympathy card arrives, gracing the day's pile of mail. A bluish white card. Its angles cast only soft shadows. Its weight is a butterfly's lightness. Its pages, the buoyant wings of a seagull. Yeah. Picturing Michelangelo's Moses. The living room sits in still dimness, but its page radiates, its page pulses alive, the page gives an electric shock, the page is a leaf of magnificence. I'm stationed on my friend's sofa, thick book on my lap, eyes perusing the beard of Moses, its layers. Those strands pull me in, take me through ages, till I'm no longer 16. I'm 6,000 years old now, acquainted with sages and multiple errors. I forget the sofa's lumps, the mundane surroundings of graves and fall away to loftiness, give way to splendor known beyond learning. Now I am 36, looking back on a sneakered and jeaned boy of 16. I marvel at him as he soaks up the wonders of that page. Soon I am 41, yet have not forgotten that glowing afternoon. I sprawled on an uncomfortable couch while enthroned in the comfort of enthrallment. I clearly recall the light shining in the marble face on the glossy page the proud demeanor of that stone figure, that sculpture dominating my weekend, as he, on a throne-like chair, sat tall, as if even sitting were standing. I recollect Moses holding a tablet upright in his robed arms and propped on his colossal thigh. A memory of his penetrating irises doesn't retreat from my brain, but day by day grows brighter. The recollection, the recollection is massive enough to diminish my present, contrasting it with the glory of a Saturday afternoon at a friend's house where organ music lifted from the page. Its life is at stake. These gusts of wind, these swirls of snow could devastate the pigeon, trap its body where no food exists, no drinkable water, no warmth. The bird finds shelter by landing on a fire escape. There it vigils, its beady eyes alert, its sense of balance challenged but asserted. Endurance is the attribute most needed in life. If you use up brain power and or run out of luck, you can still survive by way of sheer persistence, which the pigeon knows while stubborn in her stance on a rung of the fire escape, her life at stake. The Mosquito Chorus. <laughs> on the dunes or on the street, we bite. No, we drill into your skin. We extract blood and deposit malevolence. We pick victims at random. Thank you for holding still. We appreciate your patience as we infect you with the Zika virus. Shortly, someone will assist you in your illness. <laughs> Out of 300 million on this green earth, we feel a, a, one out of 300 million on this green earth will feel a slow decline in functioning, and then a fever, and then 
the aches and pains that forecast birth defects if that arbitrary, arbitrarily chosen one dares to give birth. If you are not chosen this year, other seasons, years, decades will roll along. All you need to do is wait in the comfort of your hotel room or your work office or your beach towel or your rowboat. Maybe you will be one who experiences a bite or sting from a hearty social mosquito. Mm -hmm.